Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this virtual roundtable, which is being hosted by the Elcano Royal Institute, Institute coming to you live from Madrid, Spain. Um, as you know, we're going to be discussing the impact of the um, COVID-19 pandemic in the Maghreb region. Um, as those of you who follow us regularly know, we have been organizing a series of debates on some of the regions that our institute um, spends most of its uh, time and uh, resources analyzing. So today I'm very, very pleased to be able to host this session. And we're going to be looking at the impact of the crisis on the economic, uh, social and political circumstances of the region. And um, I'm very pleased to be joined by four excellent speakers. Um, we have with us today Isabel uh, Werdenfels, who is in Berlin. She works for the uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. Um, welcome, Isabel. Thank you very much for joining us. We have Dalia Ghanem, um, who is currently in Beirut, and she is a uh, resident scholar at the Carnegie uh, Middle East Center there. Welcome. I'm particularly pleased and grateful um, for the presence of uh, Intisar Fakir, who is joining us from Washington, where it is uh, unspeakably early. So she's made a particular effort to, to be with us this morning. Thank you very much, Intisar. And she is a fellow and editor-in-chief of Sada, as you probably know, wonderful uh, publication uh, produced by the Carnegie um, Endowment for International Peace at Washington. And finally, last but by no means least, we have our very own um, Haytham Amira Fernandez, who many of you know already, and he is our senior analyst for the Mediterranean and the Arab world at El Cano. Um, so we, we've organized this conversation into four topics. Um, first of all, we will be looking at the government responses to the crisis. We will then uh, concentrate on the looming social and economic consequences of uh, the COVID-19. We will then turn our attention to the political dimension. And finally, um, the, the, the extent to which this is affecting political stability. And finally, we will be looking forwards uh, to try and see, to try and glean um, of what people's thoughts are about future prospects for reform in the region. Okay, so without further ado, I am going to ask um, Intisa and uh, Dalia to give me their views as to how they see uh, the governments in the Maghreb um, region uh, reacting to the spread of the pandemic. What measures have they put in place? And what does this reaction tell us about uh, state capacities and also the, um, the response of civil society in, in these countries. Um, Intisar, the floor is yours. Thanks, Charles. Um, in terms of government responses, I'm, I'm gonna dive right in. I, we've seen really a diversity of response. We saw governments in both Morocco and Tunisia push pretty aggressive responses as soon as the situation really began to gain urgency in Europe. Uh, Morocco went into confinement on March 20th, uh, suspending schools and shifting to online instruction. Um, they also suspended public gatherings, including mosques, which is really unprecedented in the region. Morocco declared a state of public health emergency and pr pushed pretty quickly to mobilize security forces to ensure compliance with these measures. In terms of both support for healthcare sector and economic mitigation of some of the fallout, the Moroccan government created an economic uh, watch committee to monitor the economic impact of the pandemic. The king announced the creation of a special fund, which started at about a billion dollars and um, through donations of different individuals, including average citizens, reach, I, I, I think about 20, 23 uh, to 24 billion dirhams, which is the equivalent of $2.3 billion. The healthcare sector was supported with the creation of additional hospital facilities. Uh, Morocco also announced the production of uh, locally made ventilators, face masks, and tried to, pro to procure additional medical equipment and testing kits. One thing I would add, which explains Morocco and also other countries' early responses, 
is that these governments went aggressive and went early with the response because they realized the limitations of their respective healthcare systems. If the crisis showed how quickly it can overwhelm the fairly developed and effective healthcare system, you know, in Europe and in the US, it wasn't very difficult to imagine what it would do to a system in Morocco. And I, and I think that would also apply to Algeria. Tunisia may be a little bit better off, but not much more so. In terms of broad trends, um, I think about how sort of governments handled this. One thing that I would draw attention to is that the king was the driving force behind these policies. He pushed himself to the fore as really the main public policy actor. This is generally in contrast to the air that the monarchy likes to garner, which is that they stay away from the day-to-day -day management, even as, as it is clear to everyone in the country that the monarchy is in charge of all aspects of policy in the country. We've also seen a pretty heavy involvement of security elements in Morocco. Sorry, my son is crying. I don't know if you can hear him in the background. <laughs> We've seen a pretty um, heavy involvement of security elements in, in the response. The King's task force had, in addition to technocrats and healthcare uh, experts, we saw a heavy presence of military figures. We also saw, uh, for the military figures, that's because they were supposed to support the um, healthcare sector. And in terms of national security elements, that was essentially to ensure compliance with confinement um, requirements. Some of this is, of course, dictated by the needs of, of the moment, but I think it also shows uh, really who the powerful players in the country are. And I, I can stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Dalia. Uh, well, in Algeria, actually, the government responded uh, pretty quick, but the problem was that the Hirak, the popular movement, did not uh, follow the guidelines, if I may say, of the government. And this, if anything, shows you the lack of trust between the citizen and their leaders. And actually, it was the calls of artists, public figures, uh, figures from the Hirak, uh, uh, writers such as Yasmina Khedra, for instance, that pushed for the people to stay home and to stop the Hirak, then the Algerians decided to actually uh, make a, 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 a listen to, 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 to the call. But on March 17, the Algerian president, Abdel Majid Taboun, addressed the nation. And back then, he announced a, a series of measures to fight the COVID-19, including, for instance, a tightened restriction on freedom of movement, uh, the measures included, of course, closing of nurseries, of schools, of universities, mosques, and so on and so forth. And of course, shutting land borders, suspending sea and, uh, and air connections. But a few days later, there was a cacophony. Why? Because a few days later, less than six days later, his health minister, Abdurrahman bin Bouzid, announced that Algeria would have to prepare for the worst. Uh, end of course. So then uh, uh, Algerians started, if I may say, to doubt the figures and to, to doubt the transparency of their public authorities. Since then, of course, as you may know, numbers of contaminated people have surged in Algeria, and Algeria became uh, the, the, one of the countries in the Arab world with the highest uh, contaminated. Today, as we speak, we had 4,997 uh, contaminated coronavirus cases with 476 fatalities. So it tells a lot also about the health system in Algeria. It then, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's coupled with a total dysfunctional bureaucracy and the state, the health state in Algeria has been in a poor state for years uh, with severe shortages. Uh, we've seen, you know, in the early days of the COVID-19, for instance, we've seen that despite back then a low number of infections, hospitals and medical staff were overwhelmed and lacked protect, uh, protective, uh, you know, for instance, they lacked sanitizer, they lacked uh, many uh, tools. And to denounce the lack of resources, practitioners back then staged symbolic protest while trying to protect Algerian citizens the best. Uh, but of course, there is a deep problem within the health system in Algeria. Uh, we have a health sister, uh, sector, sorry, 
that is mainly state-run, state developed with a focus on guaranteeing free access to all citizens, but it faces major challenges. The first one is poor and inconsistent services. Second one is the lack of operational medical equipment. The third one is a shortage of, shortage of medication. And fourth one is a weak planning, organizing, and monitoring mechanism. So uh, today, the, the, the confinement have been you know, partially removed to be again resettled a few days later. So there is a cacophony. There is a lack of transparency. And this, if it does one thing, it deepens the, uh, uh, the crisis of confidence between Algerians, between the citizens and the leadership. Thank you very much. Isabel, would you like to respond to that? Your microphone. <laughs> Sorry, now it's working. I'd like to speak about a few positive surprises or what surprised me positively. And I would say it's one decisiveness in Tunisia and Morocco, to a certain extent, even in Algeria. And in Tunisia, for instance, we saw great cooperation between the president, the prime minister and parliament. Then innovation and particularly regarding digitalization, this got a push. Um, a Tunisian startup entrepreneur a few days ago in a webinar said that she was just flabbergasted that within 24 hours, permissions from the bureaucracy came now where it took months before for these things to happen. In Morocco, we saw, I think, uh, how um, the government reached out to the informal sector via uh, digital means cell phones. And then we've also seen localization, um, development by um, local businesses of respirators. So there, there has been really a, a, a push in, in, in some positive ways. And then we've seen in Algeria, where, where the system is so bad, as Dalia just described, a lot of self-organization of society, of the Iraq. That, too, I think is very good. We've seen it in the other countries, too. But where governments are more performant and services better, I think um, society is less um, challenged to do it. And the other thing that was really remarkable was the high trust levels initially. I think in Morocco, they were gone once um, this draft law on curbing social media freedoms was introduced, but they were high. They were high in Tunisia. And what I also thought was interesting that we had similar discussions as we had in Europe, which were discussions on basic freedoms, on rights, on the dangers of digitalization. And we had um, something which um, possibly is not that positive, but which we've seen in Europe too. In a way, it's an hour of strong men, of those that are for decisive action. I'm thinking here in, uh, of a captain, and I'm thinking here of the high popularity of uh, Kurz, the chancellor in Austria, for instance, or, or in um, the head of Bavaria in Germany, whose ratings just soared because he was the first to go in decisively. So this is positive and negative. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, listening to all of you, I was, uh, as a layman, um, and not an expert of the region, I was surprised, actually, um, to be honest, at, at how European this um, debate sounded, um, which I think is, is in itself a, a very telling of, of the way in which the region has, has developed over the last uh, few decades. So we all know that um, the crisis is going to have a massive economic impact, of course, the three economies, the three countries that we're looking at have very three have very difficult, uh, different economies. Um, Algeria is obviously a special case in the sense that it's so heavily dependent on uh, its energy resources. In the Moroccan case, for example, um, there are industrial and also tourist, um, and as in Tunisia, uh, tourist industries that are going to be uh, very badly hurt. So how severe um, is the crisis? I've seen that the IMF has come up with some figures that people are challenging. For, for example, um, the prediction that, I know we're not talking about Egypt today, but the prediction that, that uh, the Egyptian economy was still going to grow two or 3% uh, this year, which uh, some people were saying was, was totally unrealistic. So what are you hearing? What, what are the most um, credible predictions of, uh, as far as the economic and eventually uh, social impact of the crisis is concerned? Uh, Haitham, over to you. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, um, Charles. So the, the looming socioeconomic crises, uh, 
that is the, the question, uh, how far the uh, health crisis is affecting the economies, uh, societies and stability in the region, same as in other parts uh, of the world and uh, Northern uh, Mediterranean countries as well. Now, um, we have to think uh, in, about it in about phases. Uh, we, we are still currently in the first uh, phase, which is immediate response to the health crisis uh, and stopping the spread uh, of the coronavirus that uh, causes the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, just, uh, this is an early stage. Think uh, two months ago, how our lives were uh, in the Maghreb and the rest of the world. Uh, nobody could have imagined this dimension uh, of what's happening that's now called the Great uh, Lockdown. And also the Maghreb is part uh, of the Great uh, Lockdown, as was mentioned before. Uh, so there is one element about the health crisis. Uh, we see that the figures are not as bad as the, uh, the neighbors to the north, immediate neighbors like Spain uh, and Italy. And I think that the fact that we're talking about younger uh, societies may have an impact on that. The median age in Algeria is 28 uh, years, uh, 28 and a half. Uh, in Morocco, 29 and a half, more or less, compared to 47.3 in Italy and 44.9 years in Spain, the median age. So that may be uh, part of the uh, explanation. Also, the very strict uh, isolation and containment measures that were mentioned earlier that uh, were uh, put in place by different governments in North Africa, uh, once they saw the effects that the pandemic was having in other countries. Uh, now, the question is, what will the next stages bring uh, to the Maghreb uh, and to the rest of the world? And this largely depends on the duration uh, of the disruption that's caused by the coronavirus, and that escapes the control of governments in the region and even you know other governments in other parts uh, of the world. Um, now, it also depends on the economic policies uh, that will be implemented by the governments in the Maghreb to protect their businesses, uh, their workers, the productive fabric. Uh, and uh, obviously for rentier economies, that is economies that depend heavily on, heavily on, on certain resources that they export, the states exports like uh, hydrocarbons, they depend very heavily on the, that income that's generated by uh, those uh, sales. Uh, and the drastic fall in, in prices uh, uh, at the height of the pandemic, uh, we're talking about gas, uh, in the case of Algeria, oil, poses a major problem for their public accounts. So a sharp drop in income sources, hydrocarbons, uh, but also uh, tourism in the case of Morocco and uh, Tunisia with figures uh, around eight to ten percent of their GDP uh, coming from tourism and uh, other uh, services linked to that sector, transportation, uh, the fall also in remittances from expats living uh, abroad in Europe and other parts of the world. That's something that uh, will have also a deep impact. We haven't seen the full dimensions yet, but we get an image that it's going to be uh, very important. Trade, uh, also for investments, uh, local and uh, external demand. Uh, so this will have big impact. And again, depending on the duration of the multiple crises that uh, these countries and the entire world is seeing, that the that economic and socioeconomic crisis could be deep and severe with figures of negative growth. So they're talking already in some North African countries about so seven to nine percent minus seven minus nine percent economic growth for this year. Thank you very much, uh, Intisa. Yes, I I agree with you, um, Haysam, about you said in 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 many ways the economic crisis is is an equalizer because everyone is facing the consequences of a global economic shutdown. I wanted to add a couple of details to what you've highlighted just to sort of give maybe a fuller picture for Morocco. Um, this is a global issue, but these countries have less resilience. These economies have less resilience to them. There are three different scenarios that we are looking at regionally, none of which is likely to be spared in any meaningful way, right? So in Morocco, you have the impact of a pandemic and an economy that's, res that's reliant on agriculture and already affected by droughts. In Tunisia, you've got the impact of the economic uh, of the pandemic and uh, the persistent lack of economic growth. And in Algeria, you have the impact of the pandemic and the decline of oil prices. A couple of things that I wanted to add to this 
already complicated picture is that two of the countries that we are talking about, as you highlighted, Morocco and Tunisia, rely heavily on tourism. It's a major source of income, and that's not going to be coming back anytime soon. For Morocco, the expectation is that some of the projected losses in 2020 and will be um, approximately $34 billion in total uh, tourism revenue that will be lost, 14%, 14 uh, billion from the hotel sector alone. And 98% decrease in the number of tourists is anticipated this year, which puts about 500,000 jobs at risk. The other aspect that you mentioned is the informal economy. That's a major commercial hub that's essentially been shut down because of confinement measures. And it's not clear when that'll be um, coming back. An estimated 2.4 million Moroccans work in the, in the informal sector. So that gives you a sense of the losses. I mean, with the caveat that it's hard to predict the full impact as we've talked about, the expectation is that the economic shock from the pandemic will cause the largest uh, contraction in GDP in 25 years in Morocco and sharply increase external and budgetary deficit and debt ratios. So just to kind of give you a sense, we are talking about this um, shock ending essentially 22 years of continuous growth in Morocco. That's a significant change. And um, the other point that you mentioned, Haysom, is the reduction of um, funds from the Moroccan diaspora. About 69% of Moroccans residing abroad transfer approximately one fourth of their annual income back home. Now, it's important to note that remittances provide a pressure valve against economic equality, inequality and vulnerability in the country. And you know, that's at risk. So that's going to have significant um, implications. So just to talk a little bit about what some of these countries are doing specifically in terms of economic reform, in addition to what I mentioned early on about the National Fund, Morocco is also exempting enterprises from uh, paying their contribution to pension funds. They're granting them debt uh, moratorium, and they've also reduced the interest rate from 2.25% from to 2%. Now, as, as uh, Isabel highlighted, there is a range of really good measures that we are seeing here. The question is, are they going to be enough and are they going to benefit those who need them the most? It was reported that unemployment benefits would be paid to beneficiaries beginning on April 6th. And I'm already hearing that a lot of people have not been able to access these funds. So ensuring these policies reach their targeted group, that's going to be an important determinant of their success. So that's something to watch at least for the immediate term. Thank you very much. Um, listening to you uh, stress the importance of immigrants' uh, remittances, I was wondering whether perhaps we might also address the impact that all of this will have on seasonal migration patterns. Um, you know, Spain, for example, the Spanish agricultural sector probably wouldn't be able to survive without um, Moroccan immigrant labor, which is largely seasonal and circular. These are basically people who, who go back home once the, uh, the harvesting of the season is over. Um, and I was wondering whether you think that these patterns will um, be disrupted um, permanently or, or whether in fact we may be able to return to some kind of, of, of new normal relatively soon. Uh, Dalia, over to you for some reactions on this. Uh, well, I, I, I believe that I am going to be the, the pessimistic one in this group because I don't see really positive. Uh, I am not being that positive. Uh, I, I think for the case of Algeria, uh, the uh, Algeria's economy, it should be said that Algeria's economy was doing bad already before the COVID-19. The COVID-19 is just a crisis without, within the crisis that is going actually to further deepen or accelerate the crisis, if I might say. But if we come back to Algeria before uh, COVID-19, uh, on the economic level, uh, the situation was deteriorating. The overall GDP growth uh, rate was very low uh, due to in 2003 and 2013, we all know that Algeria amassed vast foreign currency reserve changes that made it the world eighth largest holder of such 
uh, reserves, and it was around $193 billion in 2014. What? We all know that these uh, reserves have been melting like snow under the sun. And uh, today it leaves uh, very few options to the Algerian government. Uh, so uh, the gross reserves are likely to drop below 13 billion in 2021, a plunge of nearly 90% uh, since 2017. As I said, the reserve exchanges depleted seriously and they are believed to reach 51 billion by the end of 2020. And these were actually uh, uh, numbers that were uh, given by the Algerian government before the COVID-19. So I believe that by the end of 2020, the 51 billion are going to be uh, less than what we thought. The economy will contract uh, seriously. The IMF said by 5-2% in 2020. And this will lead also to a very important question that is a question of unemployment. Officially, unemployment is, uh, in Algeria is 11%, but this is likely to increase because the situation on that economic level was bad. But if the COVID-19 pandemic gets uh, keep going on, then we are likely to see more people are uh, more people are expected to lose their jobs. Uh, so there is a drop in the economic activity from 30 to 50% in several sectors. In 2019, for instance, the circle of action and reflection around the company called CARE and the Center of Young Algerian Leaders, CGD, estimated the job loss around 700,000, mainly in the private sector. And this was already before the COVID. Uh, so the, the, the COVID is a crisis within the crisis and Algerians are already hurting. We are talking about the Algerian dinar that witnessed a, depreci a depreciation of 49% between 2013 and 2018. And, you know, the, 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 the gap between wages and uh, what uh, the, the, the prices is, is, is horrible today in Algeria. So again, I repeat, and I would never insist enough, the COVID-19 is a crisis within the crisis, but the economy economic situation in Algeria was already bad before the COVID-19. Thank you very much. Yes, it's very important, I think, to keep that in mind, uh, this background context. Um, some countries seem to be incredibly uh, um, unlucky in the sense that um, the impact of the pandemic is going to be asymmetrical. We've seen that in Europe as well, and we're seeing this in, in the Maghreb and, and in other regions. Okay, so let me turn your attention now to the political, the strictly political dimension. Of course, in Europe and elsewhere, uh, the pandemic is also having very interesting um, uh, political consequences. It's, we've had a debate, uh, for example, as to whether democracies are more or less competent in dealing with this crisis than authoritarian regimes. Of course, some people uh, turning east um, in search of models and behavior that they would like European societies to imitate. So my question then to you is basically, um, what is your perception of the likely impact of the crisis going to be on the major political trends in these countries? Um, will, for example, authoritarianism be legitimized um, as a result of the crisis? Will um, authoritarian actors or authoritarian behaviors uh, receive a sort of premium uh, as a result of the crisis? Or um, is this in fact, is the opposite the case? Do you think that um, fledgling democratic actors and, and instincts and, and behaviors um, are going to be recompensed um, by the, the general public as a result of the crisis? So Isabel, if you would like to tackle this extremely easy and straightforward matter. Well, I think uh, these are, they're, they're in a way a bit two different questions. One is the question of political stability, and the other one is the question of authoritarianism. And um, I would like to split it and um, maybe begin just with, a, with uh, the question of, of political stability mm -hmm. um, or, or instability, if that's okay. And I think 
I would argue, and anything else would be over optimistic and counterintuitive, we're going to see more political instability. Having said this, um, I see some chance in Tunisia for more political stability. Now, I'd like to look at factors that I consider relevant. And I think Haitham has already um, mentioned the principal one in the first cluster, which is length of lockdowns, depth of crisis, and um, it particularly also among Tunisia's, uh, uh, the Maghrebi's most important partners, because I think that will define the willingness to support. It will also um, define the capacities of the IFIs, the international financial institutions, to come in. And I think also the whole issue of the financial institutions is going to lead to ideological clashes. In Algeria, I think it's going to be huge if Algeria, which has said it will not turn to the IMF, eventually will have to do that. If there is um, um, liberalizations, will, uh, measures, austerity measures will have to be taken. This will divide both elites and society in all three countries. So there I see um, a lot of potential for conflict. Um, also, the question is, what kind of, of, of protests are we going to see as a result? Um, how is the nature of protests going to change? Will people still go for regime change or will it really be hunger protests, hunger uprisings, basic needs? I think that is also, go and that will have a different, that will not be Silmia, that will be not the Iraq we're seeing now, that will rather be you know, what we're beginning to see in Lebanon. And then there is a second cluster of factors, which is, and I'm not talking about democratization or, or authoritarianism, not yet, because that I think is a different issue, but there is also the question um, of, of social and, and political domestic consolations, not just the external actors. And there we have the question um, whether positive things like the standing together, national solidarity in Tunisia, for instance, will survive. And here I'm honestly quite positive that Tunisia will take another leap in the direction of, of, of political stability. It has done in previous crises after the murders, the political murders, it did after Sepsi's death. Um, in Morocco, we've seen it fall apart already, national solidarity because of this law and um, Inti Sarnos is better than I do. And in Algeria, I can see a closing of ranks, but only among the <laughs> regime elites if they or should they really feel that um, they could be swept away. Then I think what will be very important is the perceptions of how successfully governments handled the pandemic. Um, this will also afterwards define in a way how much patience with the governments the populations will have in the economic crisis and how much trust. And this holds for Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Also importantly, um, how will, will the inclusive dynamics that we've seen, trying to reach out to informal sectors, bringing in for ideas, um, the, the uh, civil society businesses and making thus the, the administrations more permeable to, to outsiders, will that continue? And I think there are, again, it's only Tunisia who has a chance. Two last points. Who will be framed as responsible for the crisis? I think that is also very important. Will there be domestic scapegoating by the Algerian military? I think we're going to see that. Um, or will they um, seek to externalize the responsibility? We have seen that already with the Algerian government. Will we have conspiracy theories that would put them in good company, uh, whoever does that, with um, other international actors, very big ones? And finally, who will emerge as profiteers from the crisis? And I think there we're reaching the question of will it be democratic forces or authoritarian forces? It could possibly also be populist or radical forces. Um, the one thing, my last comment that we have seen is I think in past crises, Islamist actors have profited in economic crisis. But during the pandemic, I have not seen any strengthening at all. And it was remarkable how closing of mosques, how restrictions on Ramadan were just accepted. And I think that's quite remarkable. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Yes, we are actually learning a lot about all our societies, um, including societies that we thought we knew a great deal about already. And, and there are some interesting um, surprises along the way. Uh, Haitham, over to you. 
Um, okay, thank you. Um, I, I agree with what Isabel just mentioned, and I would like to repeat again that uh, it is a matter of there are phases, and uh, we are still in the first phase, and it will all depend, including political stability that we're talking about now, it will all depend on factors like the duration of the crises. Uh, for instance, the factor when will uh, tourists come back? Uh, when will there be a normality where income uh, will be generated by the state and people will be able to make a, a, a living and human uh, contact also is, is, and that depends a lot on, you know, factors that escape uh, completely actually uh, governments in the region. Uh, vaccine that is efficient, that can be used widely, widely, uh, or treatment, medical treatment, etc. So uh, we are already in, in a context of mobilizations and uh, of dissatisfaction by many in societies in the Maghreb, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa, in other parts of the world. And as Dalia said, uh, the COVID-19 is here to aggravate existing problems and to add more pressure on systems that have proved to be uh, inefficient, or at least they are not able to deliver um, and to uh, function properly uh, for you know, many of their, of their people. Now, but uh, societies in, in, in the Maghreb and elsewhere are asking for uh, strong states. Uh, people are not just saying destroy the state and uh, uh, we have to get rid of it. No, they're asking for strong states that protect them. They are seeking protection. Uh, also certainties at a time when people are fearing for their lives, their uh, livelihoods, for uh, sources of, of income, feeding their families. Uh, but the thing is, uh, people in the Maghreb are uh, asking those states to perform their functions, uh, as I said earlier, to deliver. And also they're asking for accountability when it comes to the public spending and to the social, social services. And here we're talking about issues of uh, life and death, uh, basically. So there's a health system uh, capable of providing uh, health uh, to people who are suffering or are sick. Uh, also, if the state is able to control and manage uh, the markets, uh, like to control, for instance, inflation, and uh, there was a reference earlier by Dalia, uh, and uh, we're seeing in different countries uh, some um, businesses are increasing the prices because they see that's an opportunity because they can uh, just try to make uh, more profit by increasing. Uh, we're talking about prices of basic commodities, of basic, you know, uh, food uh, things that are need for survival. I agree with Isabel. Uh, if we start seeing hunger revolts in uh, the broader region in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, hunger revolts or bread revolts like we saw in the 80s uh, for other reasons, but we can think of the 80s and what that led to. Uh, then uh, we will definitely uh, be looking at, 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 at a totally different uh, region in North Africa and, and beyond uh, for political stability and how the different actors will try to benefit or to protect themselves from uh, these possible shocks. Uh, will we see uh, in maybe a few years uh, from now, if things go really wrong, will we see uh, uh, structural adjustment programs maybe in, in the region because of the terrible, I mean, fiscal troubles that the, these countries will be running uh, into? Um, and uh, European aid, yes, we've seen that uh, the EU has announced some packages to try to help countries, Morocco and Tunisia. There were some uh, amounts announced about 450 million euros for Morocco, if not mistaken, 250 million euros for Tunisia. Uh, there is something uh, called the Team uh, Europe uh, trying to help other countries. There's a movement also try to um, uh, debt relief or to um, eliminate part of the debt of, of some of these countries. Mm. That will not be sufficient. That's not enough. I mean, the dimensions of the economic uh, catastrophe, if this continues for many months or even into next year, the dimensions cannot be uh, in any imaginable way covered or substituted by any type of aid that uh, Europe or other donors can give, China or we cannot also talk about the Gulf countries, the oil rich Gulf countries now, uh, like maybe in the past to provide aid to their uh, poorer uh, brothers in the extreme west uh, of the Arab world. So uh, careful with political stability uh, when, if, if, if regimes manage to, um, and I finish with this, 
to deal with the health crisis in a more or less successful way, they may have more political capital to try to do certain things. But the problem is if they do not, and if they go back to the old tactics of uh, just you know distracting attention, of uh, not facing the problems and, and, and directly of not communicating, then we can see that the breach or the break between society and states can widen and uh, you know, things could take turns if, you know, that even we cannot discard uh, violence in some of these countries. Thank you. I think, Isabel, there was something you wanted to add that you had, that had slipped your mind. Yeah, I think um, there, there's kind of two factors also that are quite important for, for the question of stability that um, are softer ones, but it is support by certain countries may be seen as meddling and may divide um, political classes and populations. I'm thinking of Gulfies here, of Turkey, of Russia, of China. Um, we also see it with France in Algeria. So this is one thing. And the second thing is, is not very visible, but we've seen it also. And we see it very much in Europe too. What can disinformation do and mm. how can this incite? I think this is going to be a major issue. We saw something in Tunisia in the past change, a strange campaign on social media calling for against measures, calling for toppling of political actors. And and it's unclear where it comes from. Um, and I think these are quite dangerous things that in situations as Heisem and, and, and all of the others described, the economic fragility, et cetera, can be quite dangerous and, and also at the, at the end of the day lead to violence. Thank you. Yes, there's nothing like a pandemic for good old conspiracy theories. Very fertile ground we're learning. Intisar, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I basically agree with everything that um, Isabel and, and Haysom um, essentially explained. I mean, it's it's an excellent rundown. I, I would just to pick up on a couple of threads that have come up in the conversation. I mean, essentially before looking at the dynamics before the pandemic, we were looking at, generally speaking, two concurring trends, right? So we had heavy state control that had kind of gradually been creeping back in since 2011 but also very powerful call, civic calls for change. And I wanna particularly highlight protests and civic action as an important trend here, because prior to the pandemic, it offered an option for people to shape policies, to undo or fix them with enough pressure, or, or at least even just draw attention to them if they weren't in the end able to fix them. But during the pandemic, this is not an option. And it would be interesting to see how the protest trend evolves after, afterwards. Um, I think one of the main trends, sort of looking at the bigger picture, one of the main trends that we're looking at here is that in the short term, governments, uh, you know, are increasing their control, as we've already seen. But the pandemic also re raises some very serious long term um, challenges that I, I kind of like to think about in terms of questions, right? Each one of these governments, as we've been talking about, was dealing with a legitimacy crisis that's very unique to their own context. And you know, the pandemic creates circumstances that essentially lessen public scrutiny in, in the short term, because regimes tend to take advantage of these moments to tighten their grip on power, to ensure their influence is undiluted. They would argue that's necessary for them to deal with the, um, with, with, with the pandemic and to effectively fight, fight the spread of the, the disease. But there is a very important opportunistic element here, uh, here as well. They have been uh, regressive long before the pandemic, and that regression is going to, uh, to uh, continue and arguably uh, ticks up. However, this is, this is again only an immediate sort of short-term outcome. I think what's important to watch is the long-term um, outcomes. These countries are about to face stark economic situations as we've each uh, outlined for, for every single one of these countries. And the, the economy is a very strong motivator for action. So unless these countries can effectively figure out how to come back, how to come back um, after the, the, the shutdown is, is finished, whenever that is, it's going, you know, grievances are going to come to the fore, economic, social, and political. And in moments of turmoil, these are very hard to separate. What's political and what's economic and what's social are essentially all the same. So 
you know, what does this mean immediately? Uh, what does this mean immediately or even in the long-term stability of these regimes? It's really hard to say. You could see increased calls for change. You can see people focused on the recovery, like Isabel argued, I, I agree with you on that. And, you know, giving the governments, you can also see people giving the governments a moment of, of benefit of the doubt as we have seen immediately after. Um, and for these regimes, I, I think it's a bit of a reprieve also in, in that there is a sense that their fate is a little bit in their hands and it depends on how they handle the pandemic. So it, it'll be interesting to kind of see how things play out and it's very difficult to predict it, uh, how these things are going to, to end up in the long term. Thanks very much. Uh, maybe we can come back later to something that one of you mentioned, which I find very interesting, which is how sometimes you get a sort of resurgence of civic pride in times like these, and that this can actually encourage um, civil societies to, to some extent, to, to regain confidence in themselves and to um, readjust their relationship with, with those in, in office. Okay, so let us now look ahead. Um, to what you think this will all mean for some of the trends that were already in evidence in these countries. In other words, the prospects for future reforms. Um, you've touched on this a little bit already, but perhaps we can take this a little bit further. Um, will the pandemic have such a massive systemic uh, impact that to some extent these countries will be blown off course? And uh, will it mean that most of their populations will decide that it's the time isn't ripe for political reform, that this has to be put on the back burner until we more or less regain um, pre-existing economic and social um, stability? Or on the contrary, will this actually accelerate uh, demands for reform? And also, I was also curious about the regional impact of this uh, for example, do you think this will increase possibilities for regional integration? Um, we're asking ourselves this question with regard to Latin America, for example, where you know regional integration was already at an all-time low, um, and it's highly unlikely, of course, that um, in a in a situation in which um, nationalism, populism, and so on tend to surface more easily. And of course, a situation in which your neighbors are often viewed as potential threats, um, regional cooperation in itself can come under stress. So uh, what, what's your take on this? Uh, Dahlia first, thank you. Uh, well, you know, I think in our predictions, we, can, we, we, we cannot predict or try to predict the future without going back to the past and history. And I think in the case of the Maghreb, it's particularly true, and in the case of Algeria, even true. Uh, so uh, let us remember what the Algerian debt crisis of 1986 and 1994 did Algeria. These crises actually showed the nature of the difficulties that the leadership is going to face and actually the leadership is already facing. Uh, so back then, the financing of imports of staple goods for 20 million Algerians represented an almost insurmountable insurmountable sorry challenge it was very difficult back then for the algerian government to find a solution to that crisis so imagine what will happen in 2021 with a population of almost 44 million algerians with a, an oil prices that have been never that low so the implementation of an emergency program, I'm talking about an emergency program, is to be done right now, and it is the first stop to be done right after the confinement and the end of this pandemic. However, for this to happen, it is crucial to reach a settlement. Let us not for, forget the politique here. Economy is related to the politics and vice versa. As long as Algeria did not reach a political agreement, we cannot think about reform, we cannot think about an emergency plan. Algerians are waiting for the end of the confinement to go back to the street. And I believe that this is going to happen because the Hirak is not showing any real or serious signs of abating. Algerians are going to go back to the streets despite the fear of repression and despite the COVID-19. 
maybe in less numbers, maybe in bigger numbers, we don't know, but they are going to take up to the street again, one. Second, la question sociale, which is the social question of housing, employment, and so on and so forth. This, for the first round of the Hirak, meaning from February 22nd to today, wasn't on the table. Algerians took up to the streets saying no to the fifth mandate of Bouteflika, and then Dawla Madaniya Mashi Askaria, which means uh, a civil society, not a military one, and then Titna which means you will all go. But at any moment, we didn't see really the social question back then. And I believe that the pandemic, the COVID-19, is going to add a layer of complexity to an already very complicated situation. The Hirak is going to take back to the street, not only with the political vision, and no to the Boon and his government, no to the military leadership, but also, it will add another social economic demands because the situation is going to worsen. Uh, so this is the first trend. The second trend is repression. Until now, we haven't seen any real serious repression in Algeria. The military kept out of the way. They marshaled other security forces, and I am thinking here about the gendarmerie and uh, especially the police to do between quotes the dirty work and to repress. But there is a serious trend in Algeria that has been going again even before the COVID of human rights violation, and you know, it, uh, the, the, uh, actually the government. Uh, despite the Boon's promises to open a dialogue with the Hirak, is actually is going in a desperate effort to stand and end the protest, is jailing more and more people. Under the fallacy, the fallacious, you know, uh, charges of harming the integrity of the national territory, illegal gathering, harming state security, distribution of documents harming the national interest. And today, Algerian citizen can be arrested just because or under the guise of distributing false or fake news. For instance, an Algerian today can be arrested because he gave figures of contaminated uh, COVID-19 Algerians who were not released by the Ministry of Health. So we are really seeing here a, a, a trend that is going to, 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 to be uh, to, to worsen with time in which uh, more civil uh, society figures, figures from the Hirak, journalists, I'm thinking about uh, here a friend Khaled Draini, but also Samir Bellagbi, Slaiman Hamitouche, all these people have been arrested just because they were saying and they were uh, 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 actually performing their uh, uh, right of citizen. So there is arbitrary arrest, there is a serious, uh, you know, um, uh, desire to break the Hirak once for all. But again, as Isabel said it, uh, and I believe that this is going to happen, in the phase two of the Hirak, what will happen with the Silmiya? Are we going to see a Hirak going and taking back to the street saying Silmiya, Silmiya, which means peaceful, peaceful? Here I live in Lebanon. I've been here for 10 years. And at the beginning of the Hirak in Lebanon, people were very adamant about remaining peaceful. But in this second phase of the Hirak, we've seen violence, violence coming from the protester because the economic and social situation is such that it is impossible not to turn violent. So this is also a question to keep in mind. And then the question of violence will lead us to another question, how the security apparatuses of these countries will react. Is the military in Algeria going to stay, you know, behind the scene and let the police do the dirty job? Is it going to step in? What will happen? So these are all questions that we should consider for the, the second uh, wave of uh, the popular movements. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Thank you. Um, I have very little to add to what Dalia said on Algeria, except maybe that I, 
I see that we keep underestimating the resilience of this regime. It always surprises us with its resilience. And I do think um, I'm maybe less optimistic about the Iraq coming back in a even remotely similar form. I think it will be very different. And I think the social question, as you also described, will aggravate everything. I think it will be a different nature. And then the question is which way the regime will go. Will it go the Sisi way or the Gorbachev way? And I suspect it will be the Sisi way. It will be going for economic reform and, and keeping repression. And I mean, one of the advantages of that regime is that it has no faces. Again, it has no face. Last year, it had a face for a while. But now um, we all think that the face it has is we're, we're in a way back also to the early Bouteflika years with a civil face to a military facade, um, with the exception that I don't think Tibun will manage to emancipate himself in the same way. But if we look at a more general level, I think it's extremely difficult to predict where we're going, but I, I think that the existing trends are being re reinforced. This is what everyone has been saying today, and I think it will be the case. And this, I think, for Tunisia would actually be good news as far as the political system is concerned, because I do think, and I'm trying to argue or find something positive, that there will be a deepening of democracy in Tunisia, but stronger authoritarianism in the two other countries. I mean, if we look at Morocco, and I, Intisar, I don't know if you agree with me, but all steps taken during the pandemic, the repressive ones, the effective and innovative ones, everything, including the transfer of funds to the informal sector, et cetera, fit beautifully with this kind of Asian development dictatorship model with the enlightened authoritarianism. and. And also the leap in digital technology in Morocco, I think is going to be very dangerous for the population and will help the regime control. And I think in, in this case, it, the question really is how deep will the economic crisis be? I mean, and I think in Morocco, it will have to be extremely deep for the government to be swept away. And then we have to think, how will external actors react to this? I mean, one thing we can be certain, external actors, Europeans also, will not be concerned with democracy these days. They will be very much, except in the Tunisian case where they like to give money because of the democracy issue, they will be concerned very, very much with stability again. And the fear of migration, Numbers have gone down, of course, because nobody wanted to emigrate to Spain, I'm sorry, or, or Italy or France these days. But this will, res <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is sad. Um, it will resume again. So I, I, I really think that there will, and there's so many unknown factors that predictions are difficult, but this is what I would argue. And for the Tunisian case, just to make the point why I think that in Tunisia, we, we, we could see a, a positive turn despite what is going to be extremely difficult economically. But if we look at, at how in this crisis, the government has acted, how its popularity has soared, how, which was the trust in government was very low before. It was high in the president, but not in the government. The government and in the output capacities, it was nil. And now the government has shown that there is output. It has shown that it is transparent and that, this, that if extra powers are given to the prime minister, this goes through parliament in a controversial debate. So everything has been done in very democratic steps. And the other thing is Tunisia is in a way constrained, even if, if I said that donors do not care about democracy that much, Tunisia has that market niche. And I don't think that Tunisian actors will move away from that because that may even guarantee them in the upcoming crisis, access, maybe a little more access or at least certain access to funds. And um, you asked about the region, Charles. I would just like to say um, two short things about the region. I mean, regional cooperation and the regional situation before the crisis came was that that we had um, flaring up of tensions between Algeria and Morocco again, with um, I think Algeria resenting, uh, Morocco resenting that Algeria has become diplomatically active again. It has a president that can move and travel and um, that in the short period received um, a lot of um, high level guests. 
and and Morocco at the same time has made headways um, regarding the Western Sahara and Sub-Sahara Africa. There have been, you know, I think 10 now consulates opened in Layoun. So there, you know, I see more rather than less tension. It's, and there is competition between all three over a role in Libya. All three want to mediate and want to have a special role, even little Tunisia. So I think, um, that we will see more competition also for funds of donors between Morocco and Tunisia, particularly. Um, and I cannot, you know, we have not seen any cooperation. We have seen Tunisians send aid to Italy, to my knowledge, and doctors. I don't know, Dalia, tell me, have they sent anything to Algeria? I don't think so. So I think everything is going this whole vertical um, uh, kind of action towards Sub Saharan Africa and toward Europe but not horizontal, this trend is going to continue. And I think it will be a lot more fierce. Final <laughs> remark um, regarding the relations with Europe. I am surprised, but I'm hearing more and more voices from Maghrebis saying, you brought this upon us. And I even had someone that I wouldn't have expected saying this said, just because a few white or this time white men were hit you are pushing the entire world into the abyss. So I think this is something we possibly have to prepare ourselves for too. That because we were hit so badly and the lockdowns, of course, I mean, I'm excluding China now. And, uh, but because we were hit so badly and had all these lockdowns, their supply chains, um, their economies were shut down too. And I think that will have an effect on perceptions and relationships in the future. Thank you very much. I don't know whether you know Isabel, there was an item in the Spanish press, which of course received a lot of attention. These uh, Moroccan uh, migrants who were arrested when they were trying to leave Spain, <laughs> not trying to get in, um, you know, which is really um, a remarkable change. Uh, Haytham, over to you. Okay, thank you. Very interesting uh, points that you raised, uh, both of you, uh, Dalia and Isabel. If I can just make some quick references to the idea of repression uh, and more authoritarian methods and the temptations of, of uh, some regimes to uh, deepen uh, the trends that we have seen over the past uh, uh, few years or recent times. Now, my, 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 my doubt is whether the old methods will work whether the dimension of what may be coming next if the duration of these crises extends uh, over time, if the old methods and the tricks even that we have been tried and experimented in the past, they will work. Um, you know, when, when we think of uh, the hunger revolt, the bread uh, riots in, in the 80s, uh, and it was mentioned earlier, I mean, the population of the region was half or even less of the population that we have today. Today, it's about 105 million inhabitants in those five countries uh, that we call the uh, Maghreb uh, region. Now, uh, how much repression will be needed if people are just asking for the very basics to survive? Uh, if uh, it, you know, states are not generating income through the, you know, the normal sources that they knew and they cannot change over you know, just a few months to very different uh, economic models, and uh, build you know, other sectors that will generate those incomes and job uh, opportunities. So my, my question again is about how repression, will it work? Uh, Isabel uh, referred to two different ways. The CC way, uh, in reference to the current uh, Egyptian president or the Gorbachev way uh, reform. My, my question is, it, will the CC way work now that Egypt is also going through very, very deep uh, socioeconomic and very dire conditions uh, where, you know, the sources of income for the state to keep its repression, because repression is expensive. You have to, to, to you know, give a lot of resources to, to, to repress. So is the CC way gonna, gonna work? And um, one uh, more comment about uh, the prospects for cooperation and for reform uh, and actually for uh, larger regional cooperation. Uh, it has been said that the COVID-19 is, is an aggravating factor for problems and, and the multiplier of conflicts in, in the entire region and the Maghreb as well. However, I believe it can offer an increase, uh, an opportunity to increase regional cooperation. I, I think so. Uh, maybe many people believe this is a counterintuitive right now, but there are chances that 
if situation gets so uh, terribly bad, uh, and this takes us back to the 80s, uh, one outcome of the mm, simultaneous crises, both in frontier economies and non-frontier, or not, least not, not so much, at that time was rapprochement between uh, Morocco and Algeria and the creation of the uh, Arab Maghreb Union in 1989. So if things get really complicated and there are no solutions and that uh, regimes can put in place, we may see, uh, I guess, uh, hopefully, uh, more integration and cooperation. And this links to uh, what Isabel just mentioned about the context uh, of the region. I mean, the Maghreb is a fractured region nowadays. It doesn't actually function as a region, it has a name. Uh, it, you know, if we consider the volume or the uh, share of intra-regional trade, it's around 4% of the total trade of the region or less. Uh, so it doesn't make much sense. They look north vertically, as, as Isabel said, to Europe and to uh, their uh, partners, economic partners, but not horizontally as much. Maybe, maybe this uh, could lead to uh, more uh, cooperation and to also opening closed borders. Uh, out of the six uh, uh, land borders or crossings that exist in the region, uh, right now, they're all closed, some of them because they were closed for political decisions back in the 90s between Morocco and Algeria, mm -hmm. others because they are too remote or militarized, Morocco and, and Mauritania, or because of conflict in Libya, so I'm thinking of the border of Libya with Tunisia, uh, uh, the only one that more or less allows for some exchanges, and now it's closed officially, and Adalia knows very well because of the research she did there, between Algeria and Tunisia, so this is not a region. Now, the prospects uh, for worsening situation, obviously they're there, but a worsening situation or even you know, worse from where we are right now will take us to other scenarios that maybe we don't want to think about uh, involving violence. But otherwise, the need to find some sort of solution to do something different may lead some of the leadership, especially under a lot of pressure, domestic pressure, to uh, more cooperation, but time will tell. Thank you very much. Uh, Intisar wanted to jump in, and then I think since it's already five past 12, we will uh, begin to take some questions. Thank you, Intisar. Thank you. I just had a very quick couple of comments. Um, in terms of the question of regional integration, it is remarkable to me that this is an issue that almost always only comes up when I'm in discussions with my European friends. I can assure <laughs> you, from my experience, it is not something that's on the minds of the people in the region itself. I, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit, Haysam, because I don't see how the situation is going to make, uh, is going to sort of create opportunities for greater integration. I think when you look at a lot of the predictions about what's coming in the medium term is we're looking at a lot of sort of protectionist policies. We're looking at a lot of sort of focus inward. I don't know that the environment is really going to create the right sort of circumstances economically, let alone the political question, which you know, you know, is very complicated as, as Isabel mentioned. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is on conspiracy theories. This is uh, something that's come up a couple of times. I mean, one thing that I just wanna kind of remind everyone here uh, of is that we are talking about a region that's extremely prone to conspiracy theories and we haven't really seen them take hold or be as prevalent as you might expect for this region. So that, you know, that might change, but the reality is so far, there's been a limit to how much conspiracy theories we have seen. The other thing on, on repression, I mean, when I hear things like the CC model, it, I, I literally sort of like, you know, I, I get nervous because I would, I would disagree with you, Haysam. Repression is cheap and it's easy, especially when you are in control of the security apparatus. And particularly when you have the international community essentially on your side, not willing to do anything. And that's, the re that's been the reality for Egypt. That's the reality in Morocco to a much, much lesser degree, of course. And I, I wonder if it'll be the situation in Algeria should the Algerian government essentially decide to crack down and they would have good reason to do, to do that right now. So that, 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 that's it for me. Thank you very much. Okay, so I've, I've got quite a lot of interesting questions coming in. There's one very specific question. I was actually up until 1 a.m. last night writing about the Green March back in uh, November uh, 75. I don't want to bore you why I do that at 1 a.m. in the morning, but 
Um, I was struck there's a, an interesting question from our friend uh, Edouard Soler from FIDOB, our sister think tank in Barcelona, and he wants to know what your take is on the impact of all of this on the uh, camps in the refugee camps, the Sahrawi refugee camps in the Tinduf. Uh, of course, this ties in to some extent with what we were, you were saying earlier about Moroccan-Algerian relations. And then the second, there are a lot of questions about the Sahel, uh, a lot of questions about the Sahel. Um, what is the, uh, what is the, what are the, the countries of the Maghreb region going to do um, or going to change in their relationship with, with the Sahel? And of course, this mainly refers to um, possible increases in, in migration flows if and when the crisis begins to get even more severe, probably in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, where states are more vulnerable even than in the Maghreb um, a few months down the line. So who would like to take the uh, Tinduf question? Isabel, over to you. Um, just very briefly, I'm um, not an ex expert at all on the Sahrawis, but um, what we have seen um, recently is that there is um, food supply problems and um, the World um, Food Programme has said that this is um, a very vulnerable um, part. Um, regional uh, part, the, 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 teen, the camps, the Sahrawi camps. And then I think when we look at um, the larger political picture, we see that um, whenever there is instability, there is even less interest in the international community to push something such as a new independent state or or even to, I mean, look at the Palestinians, um, how they have been over the war in Syria, etc., just more or less forgotten. Um, and I think this um, this is even much more the case um, with with the Sahrawis and and the Tinduf camps. So I basically see that we will have um, you know the international organizations feeding the people, and that, that beyond that we had we do not see a successor for for you know the envoy um, Guterres envoy Horst Köhler who stepped down last year. So. Um, I don't see that there will be any anything positive coming um, for for the Sahrawis and certainly not for the camps from this. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to address the, the pressure from the South, from the Sahel, into South? Oh, um, so I, I wanted to come in. Yes, I think the, the main thing that uh, is coming out right now is secure, uh, food shortages in, in the camps in Tinduf, much more so than um, any um, concern about COVID, and that might be because of the weakness of the healthcare sector, the, inavail the inavailability of testing. That's an issue across the board, certainly. In terms of the, in terms of the Sahel, I, I think Morocco is, you know, I, I, I sort of, I, I kind of sense that there is this, this attempt to try to balance really focusing on a pretty aggressive, uh, decisive uh, response internally but also trying to figure out, is this the right moment to cement ties to some of these sort of um, sub-Saharan countries to really put, to kind of capitalize on Morocco's foreign policy of looking south. So I think there are some maybe efforts to uh, try to be there and kind of provide some, some degree of support to some of these countries um, in the Sahel and beyond as part of Morocco's uh, foreign policy. But I would say that so far that's been a little bit secondary to focusing on a pretty decisive uh, domestic response. Mm -hmm. I have a very interesting couple of questions that are basically saying, well, from what, uh, from the, the biggest takeaway from this discussion perhaps is that the Maghreb is very much on its own. Um, we don't really foresee the EU stepping up to the plate because it's, it already has enough on its own plate as we all know, especially those of us who are in Madrid or Rome. Um, uh, the Americans are missing and have been for a while. The Chinese are meddling, but not, not in a terribly effective or, or sy systematic way. Um, so is, is that right? Is, is that your assessment that basically um, people are going to be turning inwards? Um, blame is mainly going to be um, essentially aimed at domestic players, not external players. Although I, I take note of what you said about um, this coming from abroad and, and from Europe in particular. 
Um, so help certainly doesn't seem to be, maybe the, the problems are coming from abroad, but assistance probably isn't going to be coming from abroad. Would you more or less agree with that? Or I'm, I'm obviously oversimplifying for the sake of debate. Yeah, I, mean, um, I think that's, I think that's, a, I, unfortunately, I think that's a fairly accurate way of describing it. I mean, there's been a global sort of order has, has very much been in flux even before this. And we see some of these trends being, um, being reinforced. I mean, America, the America first policy has in a lot of ways really changed the way that, um, that, uh, actors see sort of global order. And now you the you know you have China coming out a little bit better out of the situation than a lot of other global actors. So you might see greater projection of power um, by, by China, but the reality is immediately for the Maghreb, yes, these, the, a lot of these actors are looking at the situation and saying, you know, this is a moment where we're, that we're going to have to navigate alone. And I think for Morocco, this is very much been a realization that the monarchy has been coming to grips with for a while now. You know, they've looked at Europe and felt, despite a lot of support from Europe, they've essentially felt that the European partners are, um, you know, focused inward, that they're distracted with a lot of issues within the, the EU. They've looked at the sort of new configuration of power in the Gulf and you know, Gulf uh, sort of mercurial, I, I don't know, maybe more Saudi mercurial fo foreign policy that they haven't quite been able to identify with. And they've essentially come to the conclusion that, you know, this is a moment that we're going to have to navigate more or less alone. And this is also a moment that gives us the opportunity to, to look a little southward and engage uh, more within the continent of Africa. So I would say that this, a lot of this has, has kind of predated the pandemic and we sort of see it coming back um, more powerfully right now. Thank you, Isabel. A very uh, microphone, please. Thank you. I, I very much agree with Intisar, um, though I think we cannot totally exclude that there will be some support um, from the Gulf states. I don't know how long their money is going to hold and they need to feed the Egyptians and many others, but I do think that we will, uh, we will see some coming from there and this again is going to um, cause debates. But I think you're so right about looking south and we've seen even Tunisia, especially with, with the new president and, and, and the new government already taking initiatives. And I think this could be a chance for a country such as Tunisia that has, according to some um, indices, one of the best healthcare systems, even though it's not very good, but the private one is not bad at all, I think. Um, even French go there for um, cosmetic surgery. Um, so it is possible that um, for them, for them to discover new markets and to discover, for instance, um, exporting healthcare to Sub-Saharan Africa and becoming a development force such as, uh, as Morocco is, but in different niches in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think this being on, on, on one's own is going to be very difficult on the populations. I think there will be a lot of uh, austerity but at the same time, it may open up in the long term um, new roads and, and, and a more solid and viable economy. Thank you. Hi, Sam. Yes, let, let me go back to the, to the dimensions of the crisis uh, and the, you know, what are we talking about uh, and the big uncertainties that we still have. Uh, uh, it was uh, mentioned earlier, I think it was in the start, talking about the loss uh, of uh, tourism revenues for Morocco. Just one sector, one country. And uh, if I understood correctly, you were talking about uh, a figure and uh, the environment of $30 billion or so, uh, a total loss of um, uh, income generated by, by, by tourism alone. Um, uh, so add to that remittances, that's like what, six, seven percent of GDP in normal years for Morocco? That's a lot. So when you keep adding all those figures, and you think of the volumes of aid that these countries have received in the recent past uh, from the EU through the different mechanisms from uh, Gulf countries. You know, remember the days when the Gulf Cooperation Council invited Morocco to join uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council and Jordan as well. And they transferred, uh, I don't know how many hundred millions of dollars 
the, you know, for a few years and they, then they stopped like two, three years ago. I mean, wh what are we talking about? The dimensions are, I think, totally out of uh, what we can imagine because we're still in the first phase. I insist on these, you know, the issue of phases. This is very, very recent. It's been happening for six, eight weeks, no more. Uh, so if this continues, I think we will be in a totally different world and region. And the actors that have been pouring money, wasting money in all sorts of adventures or political, you know, whatever, influence campaigns and other things, uh, they are going to have problems themselves as well at home. And I'm thinking of the oil rich uh, Gulf monarchies uh, with all their policies that was, it was said earlier by Intisar, mercurial policies, but some of them are counterintuitive. They don't, don't make much sense uh, uh, given that they have their own problems. So how much of that influence a country like Turkey uh, uh, can continue to have in the Maghreb region, um, in Libya, the Libyan conflict, uh, the Emirates, and Abu Dhabi in particular. So I think, you know, again, depending on the duration of this conflict, of this mul these multiple crises, then we may go directly into a totally different world, different region, and, you know, very difficult to imagine and predict right now. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Dahlia to have a final word, since she's been quiet for a while, uncharacteristically quiet. Um, perhaps on the on I'm the region. I'm sorry for that. I live in Lebanon. We have electricity cuts, so welcome to Lebanon. Um, so uh, yes, I agree with uh, all of my colleagues slash friends. I I think nobody can really predict what the world and the region is going to be after COVID nineteen for the simple reason that a few weeks earlier we couldn't imagine what is a pandemic like like. Uh, look like you know mm -hmm. today I was I was talking with a friend and this is very personal but I'm sharing I was looking at my daughter who is six years old and I said is she going to remember this time of pandemic and she's only six and she already lived something that is so huge that none of us can really fathom so I think really we cannot really predict it will be even you know naive uh, of us to to try to predict but one thing is sure and I think this is really uh, the, the, the I am going to paint the bleak uh, picture of the region I do not expect really, really something uh, or any change to happen anytime soon and to be dramatic change. If I talk only about Algeria, even if the Hirak comes to the street, as I said, it will be powerful. But again, uh, we are, we've seen it throughout the year and Isabel talked about it, the resilience of this regime. We, we, we cannot underestimate it. And again, and I used to, work, uh, to use this sentence and I will close on it, this sentence, you know, for, to describe the Algerian regime, but I think it is true for so many regimes in the region. You know, it is this sentence from Giuseppe de Lampedusa when he says that if we want things to stay as they are, things have to change. It is exactly this approach of Arab leaders that have been, you know, looking at politics that way. Each time there was a crisis, they would distribute economic and political reforms, but this time there is no money to distribute you know, uh, handouts, generous handouts, and to buy social peace. So again, what they are going to do, what is the only option left here? I don't want to name it, but in a few months, we will see what will happen, really. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we have to conclude on that sobering uh, note, and all this good things must come to an end. It's uh, um, 20 past one, and I'm um, extremely grateful to you for having joined us for this very, very interesting conversation. I am certainly much the wiser than I was uh, when we started at 12 o'clock. That was brilliant. Thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, Intisar, thank you for such an early start to your day. I hope for the rest of the day goes well for you. It's lovely My to pleasure. see you all. <laughs> and I very much look forward to having you all with us in Madrid before too long. Let's be optimistic at least about that. So goodbye and thank you all very much. And I want to thank Haitham as well for having put this uh, excellent panel together. Thank you, Haitham. Take care, all of you.